Hello and welcome back to Machine Learning. I'm Javita Christie, and in this video, we are going to continue learning about early models of neural networks. And in one of the previous videos, I introduced the Maclock Pit um, model, which was a very um, basic and, and also very old neural network model. And then we also did a little bit of perceptron learning. That means we studied about Rosenblatt's perceptron, perceptron with one layer. Um, we are going to see that, um, just refresh that very quickly today. And then we're going to proceed towards uh, perceptron learning, which is another type of learning um, uh, associated with the Rosenblatt's perceptron. So there are some issues with Rosenblatt's perceptron, which can be uh, solved using a, uh, a better perceptron, which we're going to see now. And we're also going to talk about the Adeline um, network model. So these are the topics we are going to be covering in this um, video. So let's take a quick look at what we did in the Rosenblatt's perceptron. If you would like to understand this in detail, uh, you could refer to the uh, video named Early Models uh, in this machine learning playlist, and you, could, you can find it there. Uh, what does a Rosenblatt's perceptron do? So it basically has weights associated with every layer, the input layer, hidden layer, output layer. There are weights associated with each of them. And um, a perceptron, a Rosenblatt's perceptron has only, um, you know, one layer. It does not have hidden layers. So this is um, how it can be classified. Now the weights given are minus two, uh, one by two and one by four. So these are the three weights given. Um, we discussed last time that we could attach a dummy um, dummy layer sort of over here, a dummy neuron uh, that always has a value of one, which we wrote at X, as X zero equal to one. Um, so it always goes here as minus two into X zero, but because it's always one, we can uh, you know uh, not write it, it is okay. And we have four points here, P1, P2, P3, and P4, and we want to classify these points into class one and class two based on the output of our perceptron. So uh, what we do is the first point is um, five comma two. So we will be using this equation, minus two plus one by two into five plus one by four into two, and that gives us one, which is a positive value. So there is uh, y out is your threshold function, uh, threshold activation function, and we saw many functions. Uh, the function that is used here is going to convert um, the input into one if the input is positive and the input into zero if the input is negative. So in our case, for the first point, the input is one, which is positive. And that's why we are getting an output of one. Um, and we would classify one as class one and zero as class two. So that's why the output one means we are putting this point in class one. Uh, point two is having uh, the coordinates minus one and 12. So for this kind of a point, um, if you calculate minus two plus one by two into minus one plus one by four into 12, it would give you point five, which is again positive, um, which means we could put it in class one. Next, we have point three, um, which is uh, three and minus five. Those are the coordinates. So we could put that here in the equation and we get minus two plus one by two into three plus one by four into minus five. And that gives us minus 1.75, which is a negative value, which is why the output is going to be zero. And it, we will say it belongs to class two. And similarly for the point four, which is minus two and minus one, we would be getting minus 3.25, which is also negative. So it belongs to class two. Now, if you observe these points right here, then you can see that this is the kind of situation where these points are linearly separable, which means you could create one line and that line could separate um, these points. So these points are linearly separable. And if you have those kinds of points, you could do with a one layer perceptron, uh, which is what happened in the Rosenblatt's perceptron. But if you did not have um, a linearly separable data, like you can see here, um, there is class one and all these points belong to class one. All these shaded area is class two. You could just draw a line between them and 
that would be linearly separable classes because you can draw a line and separate them. But if you look at these two classes, class one and class two, I could not possibly draw a line in such a way that I could um, separate um, these two classes. So I cannot do that with a line. I would have to draw a curve, which is why these are non-linearly separable classes. And during such instances, um, it helps to, instead of using a one-layer Rosenblatt's perceptron, to use a multi-layer perceptron. Um, and that's what we're going to see now. So a basic perceptron works uh, very successfully for data sets which possess linearly separable patterns, right? Um, but in practical situation, that is not ideal because we have, just as we saw, we have data sets which are never linearly separable. And uh, that was what, that was a point that was driven by Minsky and Papert. Uh, those were two people who did research on that. Um, in 1969. So they pointed out that in reality, we always have data sets that cannot be linearly separated. So they showed that a basic perceptron is not able to learn to compute even a simple two bit, two bit XOR. Okay. So if you have a very basic perceptron, it cannot even compute a two bit XOR. Now, I'm pretty sure if you have studied, you know, things like digital electronics and basic electronics, you would be knowing what X or is, uh, of course, we are going to see that now. But um, what they want to say, Minsky and Papert want to say, is that uh, they could not, uh, a simple perceptron could not even solve a uh, two bit XR. And so uh, that's what we're going to try and understand. So let's take a look at it. So, what does a two bit XR look like? Um, you have X1 and you have X2. Uh, both can be either one or zero. Um, uh, Unlike what we just saw in our example previously, where we had we didn't have ones and zeros, we had two and minus five and all that. Now this is very simple compared to that. We just have ones and zeros for x1 and x2. So if x1 and x2 are one, then the xor produces zero. And if um, x1 and x2 are zero, then also xor produces zero. But if they are both different, that means x1 is one and x2 is zero or x1 is zero and x2 is one, then that's going to produce one in both cases. So when both x1 and x2 are equal, it gives you a zero. So that means it belongs to class two right here. But when uh, x1 and x2 are not equal, um, then it gives you one and um, then it belongs to class one. So if you plot those points on x and y axis graph like this one, uh, you will notice that the point zero, zero is our origin which lies here. The point zero one will lie here, point one and zero will lie here, and the point one one will lie here. Now, according to this, uh, zero zero and one one, they both belong to the same class, but zero one and one zero, they belong to class two. So if you highlight that portion, you can clearly see that class one and two are intersecting, uh, which means they are not linearly separable. And because they are not linearly separable, we cannot apply a simple perceptron on this, the basic Rosenblatt's perceptron, which is why we need a multi-layer perceptron. So you can see data is not linearly separable and only a curved decision boundary could separate these classes properly. So to address this issue, the other option is to use two decision lines in place of one, okay? So using two decision lines in place of one could sort out the issue. Um, so you can see here, um, this is the option A, where we have created two decision lines. One is this line, another one is this line. So anything lying between these two lines is going to be class one. Anything outside of it is class two, okay? You could alternatively do it this way, uh, create a line around zero, one, and one, zero. So anything within these two lines is going to be belonging to class two, anything outside of it will belong to class one. So these are the two options you have, creating two lines. Uh, that's what your multi-layer perceptron does. The major highlight of these, uh, this model is that, first of all, the neural network contains one or more intermediate layers between the input and output nodes, which are hidden from both input and output nodes. Because you need to create two lines, you are going to have a hidden layer. It could be one layer or it could be two layers. Um, uh, of hidden layer, but this is different than a basic perceptron. 
and each neuron in the network includes a nonlinear activation function that is differentiable. So you have to use a threshold activation function that is differentiable completely, and it has to be nonlinear, which means it does not form a line. And the neurons in each layer are going to be connected with some or all of the neurons in the previous layer. Okay, so it's going to be a completely connected uh, network, but you can have some neurons which are not connected with each other. So it's not exactly a completely connected um, network. So this is what the network looks like. You have the input layer. These are the output signals. Um, input layer will contain number of neurons equal to your number of inputs. An output layer will contain number of neurons equal to um, the number of classes. So we have two classes, one and two, which is why we have two neurons. There are two hidden layers. Uh, there are dots given here, which means you could have more than two hidden layers as well. And um, all these neurons are interconnected. So in the case of this, um, practically everything is connected with everything, but that's not uh, required. You could have some neurons that are not connected with each other as well, okay? So this diagram results, resembles a fully connected multi-layer perceptron with multiple hidden layers between the input and output layers. And it is known as fully connected because any neuron in any layer of the perceptron is connected with all neurons or input nodes in the case of the first hidden layer in the previous layer. So that means, um, uh, let's just quickly go back to that diagram. Uh, you can see all the neurons over here uh, sorry, all the neurons over here are connected with all the neurons in the previous layer. And all neurons here are connected with all neurons in this layer. And all neurons here are connected with all neurons of this layer, which is why it is a fully connected perceptron. Okay. And the signals would be flowing from one layer to another layer uh, from left to right, which means this is a feed forward type of network where signals are only flowing in the forward direction. Let's um, now talk about another kind of network model that we have, which is known as the Adeline network model. Um, this is also one of the early models developed in uh, machine learning or neural networks. Um, Adeline stands for Adaptive Linear Neural Element, which is also an early network. It is a single layer ANN, which means artificial neural network, developed by Professor Bernard Woodrow of um, uh, Stanford University. So uh, this is also a single layer uh, neural network, just like Rosenblatt's perceptron. And it has only one output neuron, okay? And the value of this neuron can be either plus one or it can be minus one. So unlike your perceptron, which had, which could have multiple output neurons, this, this particular network has only one output neuron and it can be assigned a value of either plus one or minus one. And the bias input, which is x0, um, where x0 is always one, I just talked about that um, uh, in, in a while ago. So this is the bias input x0, and the bias input x0 is always one. Um, that is also added into this, and you add an additional weight to it, which is w0, and w0 is not one. It can be anything. So uh, we add this bias input over there. And the activation function is such that if the weighted sum is positive or zero, then the output is one, else it is minus one. So if your uh, sum of the input is positive or zero, then the output neuron will generate positive one. And if the sum of your input is uh, anything other than that, that means uh, it is negative, then it will be um, output neuron will generate minus one. So this is what uh, the function looks like. Uh, why some function is simply addition of wi xi uh, plus b. We are adding b because b is our biased weight w0. Uh, so we will simply just um, take all our input neurons, multiply them with the weights, and take a sum of that. And uh, the y out output is going to be equal to either 1 or minus 1. It can be 1 if x is greater than or equal to 1. Um, it can be minus one if x is less than one. So this is your Adeline uh, network, which is a, a very simple kind of network and definitely a very early uh, neural network. 
Okay. So you could go back and uh, check the video on threshold functions, threshold activation functions, and you will find one function that looks exactly like this function. So this is exactly um, that uh, uh, threshold function that we have studied before. And this is what the diagram looks like. It's very simple. Uh, you have this um, x0, x1, x2, and xn, and um, you have a w0, w1, w2, all these weights. x0 is your bias, which is always 1. Um, and you'd sum all that and pass it to the threshold function, which is going to give you 1 for positive and 0 values and minus 1 for negative values, and you get an output. So there is only one neuron in the output layer, as you can see. So the supervised learning algorithm that uh, is adopted by the Adeline network is called a least mean square or delta rule. So it is known as LMS or delta rule. And a network that combines multiple Adelines together is known as a Madeline network, where M stands for many. So you can say many Adelines. So um, that's a Madeline network. And Madeline networks can be used to solve problems related to nonlinear separability. So even though this um, is a primitive model, you could still solve problems related to nonlinear separability using a Madeline network, which is just a combination of several Adeline networks. So I hope you understood all this, and I'll be back with the next video. So I'll see you there, and thank you for watching. Thank <laughs> you.